Secondly, in spite of that, uh, the Liberal Party front bench already locked themselves into saying no before the committee process that they called for and they said was important had even commenced its work. And the National Party decided to say no before the draft question had even been finalised. From the outset, instead of seeking ways to agree, they have looked for excuses to disagree. This is in spite of the fact that in 2019, both political parties went to that election saying that there would be a voice would be advanced. That the same thing occurred, of course, uh, going back uh, to uh, then Prime Minister Howard spoke about the need for constitutional <coughs> recognition all those years ago. Instead of taking the chance to unify, there are some that have sought only to divide. Now, clearly, there is no form of words that will satisfy some of the leaders of the No campaign. Indeed, the Leader of the Opposition gave a speech in this chamber that is simply unworthy of the alternative Prime Minister of this nation. And therefore, we will not uh, undermine the hard work and the goodwill by so many people across such a broad breadth of uh, the political spectrum, including the former Minister for Indigenous Affairs, who I pay tribute to today, uh, Minister Ken Wyatt, who worked so hard to bring us to this moment and who was included and was a part of, of course, the referendum working group that came to this united position. <coughs> Mr Speaker, alongside the proposed question and amendments, the referendum working group also published a very clear set of design principles, and I want to go through them today. One, because what they did was explain what constitutional recognition through a voice is and how it will work. One, the voice will give independent advice to the parliament and government. It will be able to make representations to the parliament and the executive government on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It can do that proactively as well as to respond to requests from the parliament or the government. And the parliament could seek its input early in the development of laws and policies. Two, it will be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people based on the wishes of local communities, not appointed by the executive government or the parliament, chosen by locals, serving a fixed term to ensure regular accountability. Three, the voice will be representative of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, gender balanced and include youth. Members would be chosen from each of the states, territories and the Torres Strait Islands with specific remote representatives as well as representation for the mainland Torres Strait Islander population. All of that work, of course, occurred under the former government, under the former government, under the report commissioned, led by Marcia Langton and Tom Karma, under the former coalition government. Four, it will be empowering community-led, inclusive, respectful and culturally informed. The Voice will consult with grassroots communities, with regional bodies, to ensure the representations it makes are informed by their views and experience. Five, it will be accountable and transparent, subject to standard governance and reporting requirements. Six, it will work alongside existing organisations and traditional structures, respecting their work and their contribution. Seven, it will not have a program delivery function. And eight, it will not have a veto power over decisions by this parliament <coughs> or by the government. These design principles are the product of years of hard work, including by members of the referendum working group. 
They also represent years of consultation and dialogue among communities. The more than a thousand meetings that took place in the lead up to the First Nations Constitutional Convention that was held at Uluru in 2017. Thousands of conversations on country, in cities and in regional towns.